Excellent. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Dominic Delbar, and I'm a field marketing manager here at Certiport. And we are so happy to have you join us for our eighth Certified Academy in Design webinar. Um, if you feel comfortable, please feel free dropping in the chat, letting us know your name, where you're from, and what courses you teach. Um, and just a heads up, um, as you may have just heard, and as I mentioned, this session is recorded, and um, you will receive a link to the full recording via email after this presentation. All of our attendees are currently muted, um, but we have set aside some time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. Um, so feel free to send some questions through the Q&A or in the chat as they come up. We have the fabulous Rosie here who will be keeping an eye on it and helping moderate. Um, and this session, let me go on to my next slide. All right. So this session is sponsored by our annual Certified Educators Conference. Um, Certified is the only educator conference dedicated exclusively to exploring the full promise of certification in the classroom by providing administrators, teachers, and industry experts with engaging, energizing forums for professional development, sharing their ideas and experiences. Um, this year certified in Orlando, Florida, and I believe Joanne is based in Orlando and Alexia um, is originally from there, and it's going to be a great event. So definitely look into attending, I believe, certified um, I believe there might be a little discount if you're a participant in the Certified Academy. So um, definitely keep an eye out for that. Super exciting. Um, and today we are celebrating all areas of design with a panel of incredible professionals from multiple areas of design. And I believe one of our panelists is actually currently um, is in the audience. So let me pause this for a second and let her in. And then we'll dive back in. Sorry about that. I know the, the anticipation is probably <laughs> probably really great. I left you on a cliffhanger. Sorry, just one moment. All right. All right, there, there we go. Perfect, welcome, Natalie. Hello. Um, very, very glad you were able to join us today. And I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. All right, excellent. Well, as I mentioned today, we are celebrating all areas of design with an incredible panel of professionals from multiple areas of design, which is really exciting. So representing gaming design, we have Alexia Mandeville. Alexia is a game designer and co-founder of Vaudeville Games. She currently teaches at game at, teaches game design at Art Center College of Design and has recently released a game chief emoji officer, which is very cool. Um, this game has reached number six on the paid casual game apps um, on iOS. Her undergraduate and graduate work at the University of Central Florida led her to extensive work in AR and VR and games at large companies such as Meta and Titanic. Sorry if I said that wrong. Um, and various startups in Silicon Valley. Today, she's building a portfolio of released games for her studio, mentoring game design students to create games and consults on design and marketing for AR, VR, and mobile game studios, which is very, very cool. So welcome, Alexia. Um, with, uh, representing video design, we have Matt Wagner and Natalie Palumbo. Um, Matt is the lead producer at Tethered and Brave Studios, and he does amazing work. Worked very closely with Matt on several projects. Um, Tethered and Brave, where Team B is a small studio based in North Texas, which creates videos for clients, including Certiport, MoneyGram, AWS, Prodigy, and more. Matt has been with Tethered and Brave since 2018, when he co-founded the company with a longtime friend and colleague, Felipe. 
Before running a studio, Matt spent six years directing all video activities at global at a global nutrition company, a job that demanded knowledge in both full production video and live streaming video. Matt is adept at the entire Adobe suite and various uh, cinema cameras. Besides video production, Matt also enjoys roasting coffee, bass fishing, bass fishing, excuse me, um, and adding chapters to his unfinished pirate novel, which is very cool. Matt, you'll have to share it with all of us after this. Um, Matt has three kids, three dogs, and one incredibly patient wife. So welcome, Matt. Um, next, we have Natalie, who also is in video design. Natalie is a trained motion graphics designer and visual effects composer, uh, compositor, as well as a broadcaster for live stream videos on Adobe's Behance platform and an Adobe certified professional in both visual design and video design. Natalie has worked with clients like Nielsen, Netflix, Yahoo, Marvel Entertainment on a variety of film and media projects such as a show and broadcast graphics packages, visual effects um, compositing, promotional graphics animation, poster design, augmented reality design, um, and more. She graduated with honors from Ringling College of Art and Design in 2017 as a motion design major, and she is now based in New York City, which is great. Natalie, we're practically neighbors. I'm based in New Jersey, so welcome. We're very glad that you're here. Thank you. Um, Next, we have representing engineering design, Dhruv Singh. Dhruv is a results-oriented project engineer with two years of experience specializing in product development and engineering. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where he gained a strong technical foundation. While working full-time, Dhruv uh, pursued a master's in engineering management from Duke University, demonstrating his commitment to continuous growth and professional development. With a passion for bringing ideas to life, Drew excels in collaborating with cross-functional teams such as product management, industrial design, supply chain, manufacturing, and regulatory. His exceptional ability to navigate and integrate di diverse perspectives ensures a successful delivery of high quality and innovative products. Ambitious, driven, and skilled, Drew is determined to make a lasting impact um, in the field of product development. So welcome, Drew. And last but not least, we have Joanne, who's representing animation design. Um, Joanne is a lecturer in the School of Visual Arts and Design at the University of Central Florida, as well as a graduate coordinator for the animation and visual effects track in the Emerging Media MFA program at UCF. In addition to 3D character animation courses um, that range from story and pre-production development through rendering and, compos and compositing, Joanne teaches traditional art media skills such as painting, drawing, and sculpting, as well as graduate courses like principles of visual language. Um, Joanne began her career in 2D animation, hand painting cells on The Little Mermaid in 1989, which is so cool. Great film. Um, and I, I noticed that those cells were a little different. So they were extra special. <laughs> so <laughs> great work. Um, among her credits as Blue Sketch artists are Lion King, Pocahontas, Mulan, Lilo and Stitch, and Brother Bear. Joanne earned an MFA in digital media from the University of Florida in 2007 and began teaching at the University of Central Florida in 2008. Um, so without further ado, I will give our panelists a chance to quickly say hi. Um, and if, there, if there's anything else that you'd like to mention about your work, uh, here's a great opportunity to do so. Hi, everyone. Glad to be on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. I'm Alexia. Everyone, Drew, excited to be on here as well. Joanne Adams, hi. How are you? <laughs> um, do you what, what's the next agenda item? Do we? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. So just wanted to, I'm really grateful that you guys are all here. Um, and I guess our first question for you is how did you first get exposed to your design area? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. So I uh, had a, a BFA in painting from University of New Orleans and uh, also had a ceramic experience and um, jewelry making experience. And I was just looking for a job 
<laughs> utilizing my art skills and also practical application and uh, wrote to Disney, uh, moved out to Florida with my husband and two kids and uh, worked in the parks looking for that first opportunity. And first opportunity was the opening of the animation studio in um, Hollywood Studios and um, got the ink and paint job because their uh, handling of the paint was very similar to handling of ceramics painting. And um, first film, yeah, Little Mermaid, which I had no idea was going to be such a big deal. That's very cool. It's amazing how just by putting yourself out there, you can find yourself in pretty incredible places. Exactly. So that's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah. What about you, Natalie? Well, I've always been fascinated with the post-production process, and I decided uh, when I was opting to continue my studies, I opted to study motion design as a major because it encompassed a wide range of areas, uh, ranging from photography, film, uh, different kinds of animation, different approaches to graphic design, and in some cases, sound mixing. So it encompassed a, a wide range of areas. Um, but I'd always been fascinated by that kind of approach. And I wanted to understand more about that process and the many different applications of it. So that's sort of where I got my start. So my background is in motion design, uh, moving forward five years in the industry. Very cool. Very, very cool. Uh, Matt, do you mind sharing how you first got exposed into your area? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, you know, I'll, I'm sure all of us all going all the way back to high school had a just a, an interest in creativity and art and design. Um, and so, you know, you jump into the professional world and it's kind of hard to find a way to make a living out of that. I ended up in a warehouse, um, miserable because there's nothing creative about picking orders and stacking pallets. Um, but I was able to get an entry level position into the marketing department at that company. Uh, and so I, I just tried to make the most of it. At first, it was all just traffic coordinating, just processing jobs, getting reviews, consolidating notes, boring stuff. But they would pitch me a job now and then, uh, a little design job here and there. And, you know, they brought in a new video person. The company went through a bunch of layoffs and they brought in a new video person, which was Felipe, who I co-founded Tethered and Brave with. And they, he needed a hand. He just needed somebody that could, who was tech savvy, who could just jump in and help him out. Um, Felipe actually went to proper college. Like um, I, I just got my degree online while I was working in the warehouse. It was a business administrative uh, degree. It wasn't even a creative degree. Uh, but Felipe went to film school and they just, he just needed a, an assistant and helper. Um, and so they put me on it. You know, hey, Matt, you know, go help Felipe do whatever he asked. And that's how I got introduced into video. That's how I got into being able to do a lot of creative work. At first, it was, you know, just basics of motion graphics and Illustrator and Photoshop, uh, but continued to grow and grow and grow in that. And then eventually, Felipe moved on from the company, and I was the natural successor there. You know, Matt, the job's yours now. Uh, so, you know, lead the team, figure out how to get everything done. And my job really transferred from almost like a, um, a beginning of a creative career, suddenly I was into management and having to be creative and manage at the same time. Um, and so that kind of led naturally into uh, wanting to uh, be an entrepreneur, wanting to start my own company, saying, you know what, I, I can be creative. I like being creative, uh, but I also have this ability and experience in managing teams and, and getting other people all on the same page to get a job done. So why not, you know? So uh, that's kind of how I got to start. It, it was it was kind of a the the back door, if you will, <laughs> um, into you know through the cor the corporate world. So, yeah, no, that's I I think that that's really cool, and I think that's really encouraging for a lot of students. Um, back in November, we were speaking with a student who was really interested in art and design and being able to be creative. Um, but then it was also very business oriented and was trying to figure out, okay, so what pathways do I really have? And I mean, this highlights that there's so many pathways that you can, you can take those skills down. Um, so I think that that's, that's really cool. So thank you for sharing. Um, Alexia, it, you just launched it, uh, an app, which is very exciting. How did you, did you see yourself ending up there? How did you first get exposed to your design area? 
Yeah, I really loved like playing games. I played The Sims. I played Neopets uh, back in the day, and I liked modding them or making websites for them. Um, so I just started tinkering with all the technologies that were coming with the the rise of the internet and um, the rise of games. So in between then and when I got my undergrad, I had been just doing like random jobs like cashier or pedicab or phlebotomist. And um, I got my undergrad in game design from University of Central Florida, and I worked at a research lab that was doing AR, VR, and serious games and simulations. So um, I worked there for a couple of years. I got my master's degree um, while working that job, and then I had moved out to Silicon Valley after that. And I didn't want to go to AAA games or like bigger game companies, so I kind of took an adjacent route that went um, from simulations to prototyping for haptic effects and tools and technologies to make games. And then I went to um, High Fidelity, which was working with Philip Rosedale from Second Life um, on like the VR version of Second Life. Um, and that just went to Meta Horizon working on what was essentially Second Life in VR again. Um, and that led me to Niantic where I um, just released Peridot, which is like a pet simulator game. And um, then I started my own game studio. So we make narrative games and we don't always do AR, VR, but um, I have done a lot of that technology just because it's been so large lately. Um, so yeah, yeah it's a lot of random stuff before I actually got into design, but um, I just typically do a bunch of, a variety of different things. Yeah, no, that's really cool. It's cool how, um, I mean, as you dabble in different things too, I'm sure it helps you in where you're at now in every uh, every aspect. So that's great. So thank you for sharing. Um, Drew, what about you? How did you first get exposed to your design area as an engineer? Yeah, so uh, I feel like I'm the odd man out here. <laughs> I don't have much creative experience. Um, I graduated undergrad only two years ago, so I've only been in the workforce about two years. Um, and like you mentioned, I just finished my master's degree in management. But what was that? Oh, I said congratulations. That's exciting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Graduation was uh, two weekends ago, so I'm happy to be done with that. But um, in terms of design, uh, I wouldn't consider myself super creative, but um, I feel like I'm in a creative role. Uh, so essentially, kind of my um, role is taking ideas, uh, concepts, and taking them all the way to a commercialized product. And that takes a lot of creativity in multiple different ways, not only in design, but like of the physical product, but in terms of designing testing methods and prototyping um, and doing physical, physical testing and qualifying the product. Um, that takes a lot of, I think, creativity, um, which I'm slowly learning. Um, like I said, I've only been in the workforce force for two years, but um, so not only, you know, I do a lot of like 3D modeling and CAD softwares and stuff like that. But, um, you know, we utilize a lot of 3D printing um, as well as CNCing, stuff like that. Um, I learned how to weld the other day, which was interesting. <laughs> um, it's, it's a lot harder than it seems, but, <laughs> but it's, it's a good it's a good skill. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. Um, I actually, when I got into this job, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, as a recent college grad, I had you know, a lot of us, I feel like, don't really know what we want to do other than, hey, I have this degree. <laughs> um, so I got an email from one of my professors who was looking to hire somebody, and I jumped in blindly, honestly. Um, and I'm gr grateful for it, thankful for it, and I truly love it. So no regrets on, on that. So, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it definitely sounds like I mean, it's a different type of a design, but absolutely design nonetheless. It does require a ton of creativity. I know that we have several um, engineering um, teachers and students who who tune into this. So I'm sure your point of view is yeah. going to be very helpful. Very, very helpful. Absolutely. Um, yes, definitely. Um, the next question that we have for you guys is, what is your favorite part of your job? I'll jump in. Yeah, I think uh, the thing that I loved very first when I first jumped into into um, any design field, but especially in video, it's the it's the variety of work. Um, so it's it's sometimes you know you need to write, you need to come up with a good 
script, a good concept. Other times it's, okay, I need to create illustrations that look sharp that get the message across. Other times it's, you know, grab a camera and make sure everything's in focus all the way to, you know, on sets. I, I'm the audio guy a lot of the time. So I'm with the headphones, monitoring levels, making sure it sounds clean. And I kind of realized early on, like, wow, this is great. This is going to be impossible to get bored. I'm always going to have something new. There's always going to be something different. Um, there's just the nice variety. And, uh, you know, when I talk to a lot of artists out there, they kind of have the same, same feeling. Like as soon as you get bored on one project, there's another project coming that's kind of different. Um, so it, it, it's a very fresh type of industry to be in. And I, especially on the video front, because there's so many different aspects. So, you know, I, I'm not sure, but, but I'm pretty sure all of us can probably agree. Like, dude, there's just a lot of different skills that we have to learn. And that's a fun kind of challenge. Like, I really enjoy the variety of it all. I have to say, I agree with you on that one. The variety of projects that come in. Um, that's something that I find with the uh, clients, the projects that I receive and work on. Um, I opted to become a strong generalist and understand a wide range of areas in the production process. But I would say that probably my favorite part of my job is taking those assets, the ones that were created, and bring them into motion and then add uh, finalizing touches like color grading, texture, timing adjustments. And one of my favorite things that comes from that part of the process is maybe it's stronger than what you had initially anticipated. In other words, happy accidents in terms of what you're working on. So uh, I would say that that is the most exhilarating part of the process for me, in addition to what you said about the variety of different kinds of projects that come in. Uh, I'll answer. I think that the favorite part of my job is the iterative process. And like Natalie mentioned, with like some of the finishing touches and polishing, like that's not stuff that you see um, as an end user um, of the final product, you, you don't get to see like those iterations and those incremental improvements. And I really like showing that off to people because it shows just like how much work goes into the process um, that can be overlooked so easily. Oh yeah, absolutely. It takes a lot of time and a lot of, you go through a lot of happy accidents. And I think that is a really cool part of the process, but to your point it often gets overlooked by the end user but there's a lot of really cool things come during that process. So I love that. I'll, uh, I'll jump in. I think one of my favorite parts is seeing the final product. Um, I was walking uh, through Home Depot last weekend and for the first time I saw my most recent project on the store shelves and I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I think just seeing that and honestly reading the reviews online um, and just seeing how people have connected with it and seeing, hey, you know, like, you know, I designed this certain, you know, sub assembly or the system and how that's either functioning well, but sometimes you also get bad reviews. And, and that's a learning moment right there. It's like, you know, for the next project, how how do you improve that? How do you fix those bad customer reviews? But I think my favorite part is definitely seeing seeing your idea on the shelf of a store, <laughs> so. Um, for myself, my students are amazing. Um, I find their creative energy very invigorating. And it's also uh, the wide variety of projects. And I have my own thoughts having worked so long at Disney um, about how, you know, what animation is, but they bring in so much more to it. So um, lots of story, lots of creative energy, lots of um, technical development. It's, it's a very fun field, but it's very, very um, engrossing field. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And thank you all for sharing. Um, I think that it's really inspiring to, to hear about really what gets you up in the morning, what your favorite part of your job is. And I think it's really encouraging for students and teachers who are actively preparing the future designers of the world. So thank you. Um, the next question is, in your opinion, what is the most important skill for someone in your area of design? Uh, I can go ahead and jump in here. Yeah. So 
I already was familiar with the programs, uh, the Adobe Creative Suite, Cinema 4D, um, sort of the general basics to start with. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to understand strong design and concept so that I would be able to work from the ground up, starting from scratch on any given project that comes my way. Um, that would allow for a variety of ways to creatively problem solve, depending on what the project parameters are, what the client is looking for, um, the deliverables in general. But uh, I, I think it's also important to understand how the how technology is advancing and how also the industry grade software is also advancing and what the capabilities are now versus what they're going to be later on. And also knowing where the industry is going, what their approach is going to be later on so that you can move with the industry and the technological advancement. So it's always important to pay close attention to the technical aspects of both you know, the equipment that you're using, but also the advancements of the software. But at its core, knowing about the foundation of design and concept and strong animation and being able to bring that into those programs and represent your work in the best possible light. Yes, I, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, if I can add on to that, I think that's a great point, Natalie. Um, just having strong fundamental concepts uh, down. But um, to add to that, I think as an engineer, as an engineer, you want to get things right the first time, and it has to be absolutely perfect. And I learned very quickly in the design process that's usually not the case, and you don't have time to make it perfect. <laughs> so you have to iterate multiple multiple times. Um, I remember my first design project. Um, I just I was designing for you know maybe three weeks, and my and I really you know I could go for another ten weeks in the design process and get it perfect. My manager was like, nope, you need to kick it out the door and you need to get something in hand because uh, you learn a lot more after you have like a functioning prototype. Um, if it's a physical product or, or a digital product, I think. Um, so I think, you know, something that's most important is knowing that it's OK to not be perfect the first time. Um, just get your feet wet, <laughs> you know, get something out the door um, and kind of learn from your first iteration, I think, because uh, I, I personally would get bogged up. I, you know, I would like, I need to get this perfect, but you know, it, it's okay. It's okay to not be perfect the first time. <laughs> That's really, really good advice. I think, especially for individuals who are just getting started or teachers who are preparing their students to enter the engineering field is it's okay if things are not perfect and that it's okay if you have to update um, and to iterate, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I love that. And I plus one that and add on to it because I love to tell my students and the people I work with to show your ugliest work as soon as possible so that you can get feedback from the entire team and uh, to answer the original question, but like testing and iteration is, is the most important skill for somebody in games and in many areas of design. Um, just to make sure that you're working on the right things and um, making the right thing for the, the audience, um, either posting it to your, your coworkers or your teammates or posting it on Twitter or posting it more broadly to get feedback as early as possible. Um, I've seen a lot of people hold things too closely to their, their heart and it often, they draw it out too long to the point where it's like, you've done so much work and it's not the right thing. So making sure to just like test and iterate and be a proactive communicator in that aspect. I love that. I love the phrase that you use, show your ugliest work first, I think is what you said. I, I really love that. And I, I bet that that's a really difficult thing. At least for me, it's a difficult thing to be able to put yourself out there. But to your point, um, that's how you make sure that what you're creating is meeting the mark. So I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I can second that in the, in the video realm. It's really, it's so easy to get caught up in, I'm going to make this so gorgeous and beautiful and it's going to be spectacular and I don't want anybody to see it until it's, until it's to that point. But then what happens is, the, you know, the client or, you know, the, the project owner is like, whoa, whoa, wait, this is off the mark. This is, but you're so far down that now you've completely ruined the timeline where a lot of those changes would have been caught early on. If um, if you just would have been willing to to you know take it on the chin 
um, as far as the feedback goes. And that's always hard for a creative professional to, to take that, to take that feedback on something that's your baby, you know, and you've, you've got to, if you're going to come into the creative industry, you've got to realize it's an industry, which means, you know, it, it's, it's really, it's driven by money, which means we're all going to have to work on projects that we don't necessarily like. And the end result is oftentimes going to be not to our liking. Um, but as a, as a, as an artist, you get to have full control as a professional artist, you don't get full control. Um, unfortunately, other people have a say too. <laughs> so being able to work with a team is very much about kind of checking your ego at the door and in, in being willing to, willing to give up on your ideas in order to embrace somebody else's ideas. And there's, that's a learned skill because, you know, when you grow up as an artist, it's you and your creation and that's it. Um, but then when you enter into the industry, that changes really fast. And suddenly your thing is everyone else's thing and you've got to learn to work with them. I would also say to uh, tag on to what Natalie was saying, the ability to learn fast, like really fast is absolutely critical. Um, and that's something that you, you, you never have all of the knowledge that you need going forward. Anytime you're going forward into something, there's going to be new knowledge you have to acquire. And chances are somebody's expecting you to acquire really fast. And so being a quick learner is really critical. And that's, you know, some people will naturally say, oh, I'm just naturally a quick learner. But really, it's a practice skill. And it's about keeping your brain in shape. Um, and that's, that's kind of hard to do when you get into the grind of just working and getting through projects and stuff. And you almost forget how to be a learner. Um, and so you have to really focus on, okay, I'm going to make myself go learn something today. I'm going to make myself go read. I'm going to keep my mind sharp. I'm going to keep my ability to acquire new information really sharp because at some point you're going to absolutely need it in order to keep up. Yeah, I really like that too. I like how you also, how you tied that back to not only having a strong base, but keeping up those technical advances. Yeah. It's, it shocks me sometimes how fast technological advances happen and to your point it's vital to keep up sorry Natalie I don't want to cut you off it looks like you're about to say something as well oh no I was going to say that I completely agree with all of that I like what you said about uh working with clients you know versus working on your own projects uh one thing that I always like to do is I always want to keep the relationship between creative and client uh completely professional and respectful and I always want it to finish on a good note so they get ultimately what they're looking for. But I'm also happy with the end result myself. But that way, one thing that I've discovered with the clients that I've worked with, uh, especially in the case of independent filmmakers, uh, a lot of the referrals that I get are from people that know of me because I worked with another person that they know of. So it's important to keep that relationship as strong as possible and ultimately uh end the project successfully let them be happy with what you're working on but you know you should also be proud of the work that you put together too but also keep in mind it may lead to future opportunities as well that is a great point brilliant point yes um i i really agree with both matt and natalie those are, are, are great points i teach my students that they need to learn how to look at people while they're speaking to them so that they can pick up those cues that tell them whether or not their communication is working. Um, and that's that's like a massive skill to have as professional. You have to be able to understand that, um, one, I agree, sublimate your own ego. The most important thing is your production, right? And if you're on a major film or a game studio, or whatever, you're still going to be working with hundreds of people. Um, be polite. <laughs> Please and thank you go a very long way you know yeah no absolutely thank you um our next question is uh what advice do you all have for educators who are encouraging creativity in the classroom yeah i can jump in on this I, um so i would say finding something that they actually care about is is super important um i recently just joined onto my team a couple of high school kids just to help out and start learn some video editing and stuff like this. And I need help with the on the editing side. And it kind of became obvious pretty fast that they weren't huge fans of 
of video editing. Um, <laughs> it's kind of mundane at times. They're willing to help, of course, they want to jump in. But I was like, you know, we need to find something that they're really interested in and that they really want to learn. Um, and so I, you know, I asked them, I was like, what would you guys, rather, we're, we're currently working on a video for Unity for CertiPort. To, and, and I was like, what would you guys rather learn? Would you rather spend the summer learning video editing or would you rather learn the summer going through Unity tutorials and learning game design? And it, the answer was immediate and, and just so strong. Like, look, we'd rather make games. Oh, well, all right then, let's, well, let's learn how to do that. And so, but finding out what they actually care about. Now, are they gonna be able to learn video editing at the same time that they're working on their game designs? Yeah, yeah, they're gonna learn that stuff as well. Um, but it's, it's from a place of what's the core motivation versus, you know, what, it, what do I just want to get from them? Um, and so, you know, it's a lot easier to, I guess, pull than push or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, finding something that they are just naturally gung-ho about is, is makes everything so much easier. And, and so that's kind of what I've been learning recently. I love that. Yeah. Meeting them where they are, where, where their trajectory is. Yeah. I like that. I'd like to jump in on that too, as um, I get feedback, you know, and we all, if professors, any professor gets student perception of instruction after every semester, and I get a consistent comment that they enjoy that I love my subject. Wow. Because um, other professors uh, try to be authoritarian and it doesn't work, especially in a creative field. Um, you're not teaching them the right way. You're Thinking, teaching them how to think about what they're doing. Um, you know, there is not a rigid method and um, rigidity just kind of kills the whole class experience. Yeah, I love that. I love uh, your comment, especially you should also be passionate about what you're teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that makes a huge difference. Yeah. I think adding on to both of those ideas, um, what I would suggest and something that was done when I was studying, um, I would consider presenting industry examples of successful innovation, uh, regardless of what part of the design department it's in, if it's in product design, graphic design, if it's in AR, VR, if it's more experimental, um, see what's out there, see what the studios are making, but also in addition, uh, see how those studios progressed over time. Maybe if one of the students wants to go to work for a specific studio, as an example, um, study what they're doing, how they progressed, how they evolved over time, what's, what processes they are adopting and bringing into the production process on their end, but also how it's evolving. But in addition to that, you know, where where the technological advancements are going in addition to that so that they can jump right in and they know what to expect. Uh, I, I do like knowing that, um, that the emphasis on enthusiasm, not just from the students, but the instructors as well, that does make an absolute difference. If the instructor is excited about what they are teaching the students about, it does make an absolute difference. I know it did for me when I was studying both motion design and basics of visual effects. Um, so it is definitely, it makes an absolute difference, but looking and seeing what the studios are doing out there and adopting that into the process, you know, just at its core researching, knowing what's out there and knowing what the students are excited about, I think is the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, I I love that. It reminds me of a story that my, my grandpa was telling me. He was studying engineering um, and his professor was focused on this one type of engineering. He said, this is the only type of engineering that you'll ever need. And then my grandpa graduated and he didn't know any of the software that was needed to be successful in engineering. Um, had that professor taken time to get to know the industry, what the demands were, it would have been a very different story. So I love that. I, I think that that's very important. So thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that. I think early exposure to what's out in the industry is is very, very critical. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking back in college. I mean, we had exposure to 3D modeling. We had like one class, um, but having more, you know, exposure, maybe even high school level would, you know, set that foundation very early on. And then that way the students can realize, hey, I really like this or hey, I really don't like this because it's just as important to know what you don't like. Um, 
then to figure out what you do like. So, you know, maybe having exposure to, you know, computer modeling early in high school or, you know, having a 3D printer in, in the classroom to kind of show like, hey, this is how the industry actually does it. Um, to show like real examples. We're not just teaching you because, you know, we want this to be taught. Is because this is what's being used right now. Um, so having those industry experts come into those high school classrooms or college classrooms and share that, I think, would be really important um, and really valuable. Yeah, the real world application. I like mm -hmm. how you said, like, I mean, not you're not just teaching it just to teach it. There, this applies somewhere, and you can use this and have a career out of it. Yeah, yeah. I really like that. Yeah, what my students have liked the most is seeing all the nitty gritty background stuff um, of like Steam pages or stats or all the stuff that went wrong with our games. Um, and then just like from a structural standpoint, what's worked for me is like set a goal for what the project is. We're working on a puzzle adventure book. And then I've already done that project myself. So I provide them with like templates and show them examples of like how I did this thing so that they can take the topic that they're most interested in, whether it's like uh, hats or chickens or whatever, and then they can apply that topic and then go through the process kind of like with me to get to the end goal. Um, they really enjoyed that, just seeing all the, the super mundane like day-to-day -day production stuff. Yeah, I, I really like that too. So thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, I think that that, was all very great advice for educators. Um, the last piece of advice is more specific for the students. And it is, what advice would you share for students looking to have a career like yours? Uh, I can go ahead and jump in with this yeah. one. Uh, the first thing that I would advise to any students considering going into motion design, visual effects, anything related to film and animation, research. Research the job, research the project, the client, if there's any branding involved with a client that you're working with, take that all into consideration that can only help you with the entire production process going from concept develop, con from concept statement, excuse me, all the way to the final deliverable, whether that's a graphics package or if you're doing visual effects compositing on a film and you have to work on a specific scene, uh, it could be a wide range of different projects that you work on, but at its core, you're going to want to do the research and show that there is a uh, that there is a care taken with any given project that you work on. Um, I would also say that in addition to researching, and this pertains more to looking for opportunities, uh, match your skills and experience that are outlined in that specific job post. So if it doesn't specifically match up completely with what your training is, there's going to be other opportunities out there that will. So it's just a matter of sifting through and finding the ones that do match your training and being able to apply yourself to the ones where you know you can jump in right away and work on those specific projects. Um, in addition to that, I would say you should focus on what your strengths are, where you want to focus your work. Um, you know, if you if there are specific projects in your portfolio that you know you're more drawn to, that kind of work, I would go in that direction and see if you can find more opportunities based on those specific projects that you had the most enjoyment from. Um, I would also say that in my case, understanding the different approaches in the case of motion design and visual effects there are two there are a couple of different approaches there's the approach that is more generalist where you understand a wide range of different kinds of processes um but on a more basic level um as opposed to understanding it more on a specialist level um it's a matter of do you want to understand a broad range of areas or do you want to be well-versed in one specific kind of area. And there is a distinct difference between the two based on what you want your approach to be. Um, in my case, I wanted to be a strong generalist. And when it came to uh, problem solving with uh, clients on creative projects, I never wanted to say that I can't. And I would, I always try to find a way to problem solve and give the client exactly what they're looking for 
uh, regardless of what that involves. So finding a way to successfully complete the project and bring it back to the client and for them to be happy with it. Um, you can only build your momentum based on that. Um, so that's sort of my take on it. And in addition to that, um, I would also say for students, um, don't be afraid to see what you can do with what you've learned in terms of how to take the design and animation principles and meshing them with the software that you're working with, the programs, and see what you can come up with, see what you can play with. Um, you may be surprised to find out, you know, that there's an approach that if you take it in this direction, it may open up doors for you in terms of what visuals you can create later on. Yes, yes, I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I can go. Um, advice I would share with students would be, um, interviewing and the job are two different things. I think looking for a career, um, a lot of people don't do enough practicing for interviewing. I know it sucks, but it is like a reality of getting jobs. Um, and a lot of places are looking to do design tests with, with new hires and really rigorous interview loops. And um, one, it's okay to say no because you don't have enough time to do those things. And two, if you do say yes, like it is, it's, it's a practicable thing. So I show my students some of the design tests that I've done for companies and like, I didn't get a job at Epic and I had this really awesome design test and that's not anything personal about me. It's just like somebody else is better than me. So they hired that person. Um, so it is a really competitive landscape and just because you were rejected or just because you um, failed in your eyes doesn't mean it was like about you. It means it there was a more competitive person than you. Yeah, yeah, I love that. It's the it's the hard part about applying for jobs for interviewing to get to that point of having a career is that process, especially in design, especially when you're putting yourself out there and uh, you're beaten out. But I also like how it ties back into what Natalie was saying too, that the importance, it really highlights the importance of applying for jobs that match your skill set. I can't imagine how scary that would be to apply for a job, have a design test, but that's not actually what you focused on. So yeah, thank you, Alexia. One thing I'll, uh, I'll add uh, that I would share uh, to students is to not be scared and to believe in yourself. I think that's a really big thing. Um, there were many times during engineering school where I did not believe in myself that I could pass these classes, um, but sometimes you just have to buckle down and you have to, you know, put your head down and do the work um, and, and kind of do it that way. And, you know, there are a lot of times where I second guess myself, of, you know, can I do this or can I not do this? But you just have to, you have to keep going. If this is what you want to do, you have to keep pushing um, and really believe in yourself, I think is a really big thing. And, you know, hopefully uh, more than likely it will pay off in the end. Um, but it, it's also a constant learning process. Just because you've gone through school and you've gone through, you know, undergraduate or graduate school or high school, that doesn't mean you're done learning. <laughs> it's it's a constant progress, a constant process, I think. So just to, don't be afraid. You know, I think that'd be a really big thing and, um, you know, believe in yourself. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think that that is major. And I like how you also emphasize it, always learning. And I like how sometimes, well, I don't, Personally, it's really hard, but sometimes learning involves stumbling, but that stumbling, as we've talked about, is part of the iteration process, and uh, it's a good thing. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, Drew, Drew stole my answer. I mean, <laughs> it's not cool, man. Hey, great, we great talked money. about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was going to say almost exactly the same thing. Like, you, you, students, please be patient with yourself. Um, you're going to want to get to the finish line, and but it, it it's going to take time and never be um, never be intimidated by the mountain. You know, you you're always at the bottom of some mountain and you're looking up like, oh, my gosh, how am I going to get up there? Like, how am I going to fit even on a, sing a single project can feel like a mountain sometimes. And when you think about a career or an awesome job that you want, it can really feel like, wow, there is no way I can get up there. And, and then you're going to be like, no, I can do it. And then you're going to rush and go really hard. 
And then you're going to find out that you're not there yet, you know, and then, then it's easy to lose patience. Um, it's easy to think, well, I guess I'm just, this is just, isn't for me. And that, that, that's not true. It just takes time and it just takes commitment. Um, and so exactly what Drew said, believe in yourself. Uh, you do have what it takes. I, you know, if you can just stay committed and continue to work, you will get to where you're going. Uh, it will happen. Uh, eventually some doors got to open and you don't have a lot of control over when doors open or what doors will open, but life is filled with open doors. And so it's a matter of staying on it until one of them opens for you. Uh, so be patient with yourself, believe in yourself exactly like what Drew said. Uh, that's the best advice I can give. I mean, everything else will come if you just stay on it. I like that. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Um, just the only thing I have to add is like, for me, it was putting myself in the right place. Um, you know where the industry is, go there. Um, if you have to be the security guard, be the security guard. Uh, one of the directors for Disney started out as a tour guide on the tour of the animation building. Um, a lot of PAs have stepped up into camera and animation and effects. Um, just get in the door and get exposed to all that, you know? Yeah, I really like that. Just if, you, especially if there's a specific place that you want to be, just, just get in the door any way you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I really love that. So thank you. And thank you all so much for sharing. I know that I definitely learned a lot. This has been incredibly insightful. Um, and I hope it's been, I, I know that it's likely been very helpful for our participants who are both watching live and later on as well. Um, I'd like to open up the Q&A um, for our participants if there are any questions. And while people are popping things in the chat, is there anything else that the panel would like to share um, while, while questions are coming through? Any other thoughts that you're like, oh, I'd like to add on to that? If not, that's fine. I just wanted to give you the opportunity. <laughs> okay, perfect. No worries. So one came through. It says, I know you talked about how educators can encourage creativity, but do you have any specific examples that come to mind of experiences in school that are, are encouraged the other skills that you mentioned today, like research or working iteratively or learning how to learn, collaboration, things like that? Can I jump on yeah. that one? Yeah, absolutely, John. Yeah, I like to use associative thinking in the classroom and we do mind maps. We pick a subject and we write a story based on feedback from everybody else. And we do the whole, here's the subject, here's the root here, root here, root here. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Oh, give me a color for that. Give me a, you know, what does that look like? How does that feel? What, what, what you know, what's, um, what's this character's motivation? Because eventually all this mind mapping and this uh, creative energy uh, the collaboration of it, it winds up with a, a character, a story, a base for the story, and uh, motivation, you know? Yeah, I, I really like that. I like that. That's a really cool exercise to go through. Anyone else have something you'd like to add? I can add something. Um, a specific example of just figuring out how to do other skills and other things um, trying to prove something or someone wrong. It sounds horrible, but at the same time, you if you're trying to solve a problem or uh, prove something wrong, like a hypothesis, you're going to do a lot to get there. And that led me to learning data science. It led me to uh, learning just how to research and write papers and communicate with people um, more properly. So just figuring out like what the end problem is and then working back from that um, does a lot to kind of motivate you to figure out other skills. I really like that. And I like even the process of figuring out what the end problem is too that requires research within itself. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, jumping off to what they, jumping off of what they said uh, earlier, um, we did something similar to a mind map where we would go through different kinds of concept briefs so that we would have to put together style frames based on different approaches. And a lot of that was more experimental in terms of motion design. Uh, one of the ones that stood out to me was audio interpretation, uh, namely because that became my fall senior thesis because I had found out from my instructor that I experienced sound to color synesthesia. So going through those different prompts 
you may find out uh, certain details about yourself that you didn't know prior um, based on those prompts. So in a sense, you know, stepping back and just sort of analyzing, you know, interpreting based on what you think the best approach is, and then discovering that it opens up a whole other realm for you. Um, I would also say that uh, we also did proof of concepts for different kinds of approaches for senior thesis, where we would have to go through and show an example where we would analyze a specific program. In my case, it was uh, playing with projection mapping. So analyzing the program that would allow me to do projection mapping and seeing how it works and parlaying it into a presentation format, uh, showing that I understood the prompt and understood uh, what this could do and how it could help with that thesis project. But doing those little assignments will also, I think, allow, allow you to expand your capability, you know, in terms of creative thinking, but also your understanding of the different kinds of software that you can work with as a creative. So it may open up doors that you didn't expect. So I have to agree with uh, everyone else that's uh, spoken about this topic so far. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So yeah, one thing, a few things I really think are super important to include in any sort of educational you know, uh, course would be group projects. You've got to put these students together, make them work together. And at the end of the day, the, it, it's not even about the end goal of what they're creating, but it's about people skills. It's about the soft skills of working with the team. You know, artists are notoriously, you know, weird, you know, <laughs> introverted. They want to do their own thing. They want to be, you know, and so it really takes time for them to really learn how to work productively as a team member, as opposed to being an individual. Um, the other thing that I found that really lent to that as well in school was uh, showing portfolios and doing a class, you know, literally in photo class in high school, we had to take our, our 12 favorite photos from the course and line them up in order. And the teacher was very like, look, this has got to make logical order. It's got to be, it's got to be chronological or something. It's got to make, it's got to flow. And that I didn't understand. I was like, what is this? Just a bunch of photos. Um, and so I didn't do very well at that. But then what happened was the class, the students, my classmates were giving me feedback during my presentation. It was, okay, here's my portfolio of all my photos. And they're like, Matt, you know, hey, you probably should have that one that's eighth. That should be the first photo. And, and then what I realized is that I was learning people skills. I wasn't actually learning how to order my portfolio. I was learning how to listen to feedback from my peers. And so group projects and group and class presentations go a long way to helping artists learn people skills, soft skills, listening skills. Um, so I would say definitely uh, include those. Yeah, I love that. And I love how that ties back to a comment that you made earlier too about um, the design process when you are working in industry, it's vital to know how to work together to check your ego out the door. So I love that. Thanks, Matt. Matt stole mine this time. <laughs> you guys are on the same frequency. <laughs> uh, no, one specific thing I would add, maybe like if the budget allows, uh, 3D printing, I think it's a really big thing uh, nowadays. Um, you can yeah. get some pretty cheap. Um, I have one sitting right over there and it was like 200 bucks. So, and then just get your hands dirty, you know, uh, learn the ins and outs of, of, the, of the machine see what you can do with it. There's a lot of things that you can, you know, create. So not only do you have to learn the actual physical process of 3D printing, but also the design aspect, right? Like, what am I going to print, right? So, and how do you print for manufacturing, which is another thing, um, or we call it DFM, design for, manufa design for manufacturing, yeah, DFM. Um, so learning those skills as well very early on um, would really help out, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Um, well, that that's all really phenomenal feedback um, and advice as well. I think the educators, someone even typed in very insightful, inspiring, and I agree. This is very, very helpful, and we're very grateful for your time today. Thank you. Thank each of you, or thank all of you for taking time out of your Wednesday to join us for our, um, our academy today. If anyone has any additional questions, please reach out to us. 
we're more than happy to answer. Um, and where possible, I mean, where's the best place to connect with each of you if someone has any questions? Do you prefer email, LinkedIn? Um, I have my university email. Perfect. Which is my name, uh, joanne.adams at ucf.edu. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah. And we can gather uh, the additional information afterward too, so people can further connect. But again, thank you so, so much for, for your time and for your thoughts and expertise. Um, it makes a difference. Um, for all of our academy attendees, this is a reminder that next week is the final um, academy. So please mark your calendars uh, next Wednesday at 3 or at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and thank you again. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Enjoy the rest of your week. You too.